All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to, here, let's do, I think I'm supposed to, there we go. All right, let's go back one here. Don't want to bother you with legal, okay. Um, <clears throat> so my personal open source journey uh, started around 1997. Um, I was working at HP. I worked at HP for about 30 years, and I was actually running a HP UX uh, kernel development lab. And so I've been uh, doing this, and sort of Linux was this thing off that nobody really knew what it was. And uh, we kind of brought it in-house, did some porting, and that's kind of how my journey around Linux and open source started. In 2002, um, I ended up writing this book called uh, The Business and Economics of Linux and Open Source. My motivation at the time for writing the book was that uh, very few people understood really how open source works, how the business models works, how the licensing paradigms work, and how all of that stuff comes together. And um, just like the industry didn't quite fully understand how all this worked, even internal to HP, there was a gap of knowledge. So my primary motivation was actually as an education tool for the management and executive teams um, at, uh, at HP. And, uh, and actually uh, worked pretty well. And, um, and it was a, a big effect. Now, for all of those who consider themselves open source experts and you know, who live and breathe open source day in and day out, um, and in audiences like this, I'll often uh, ask a test question. And um, by far and away, most people fail this test question. And the test question is, how many open source licenses are there currently? And uh, you know, I'm not going to do it here, but in, in past audiences, you know, I'd probe and I'd get everything from there's only one to there's a million, right? And I'd get answers everywhere in between. My last count, if you're curious, I wonder what the answer is. Um, my last count was 71. Um, the reason I mention this is that in 2003, I gave the opening keynote address at Linux World. And in 2003, uh, the reason I gave that keynote address is that I wanted to uh, set off what I'll call a set of alarm bells to the open source community that um, there was a clear and present danger that was being ignored by everyone. And that clear and present danger was license proliferation. So I just told you that my last count, uh, which could be off by one or two, was around 71. In 2003, the number was 58. So in the span of about 10 years of the existence of open source, 58 open source licenses have been created. And at the time, there was a tendency for people to create what we call vanity licenses. So IBM had a license, Sun Microsystems had a license, and so on and so forth. Um, and a funny little story, uh, for those of you around back then, Steve Ballmer, then CEO of Microsoft, um, would call um, you know open source and Linux an intellectual property killer. It was a cancer. You know we're all gonna, and then you kind of see that you know, from Jim's presentation this morning how Microsoft has kind of fully come on board. The interesting thing uh, which Steve did not do back then is that if you wanted to kill open source in 2002, 2003, the best thing Steve Ballmer could have done was to go to the industry and say, open source is the greatest thing ever, and every company should go and create a license. <laughs> and you know what? At the time, given the level of understanding, I bet you that every legal department would have gone out under direction of their CEO and gone to create an open source license, and we would have ended up with an intertwined mess of licensing that was unresolvable and nothing in the open source community would have worked with anything else. And so um, now we're basically, uh, thank, you know, we, we kind of worked through that. Um, I had some fun through that, and we've, we've really contained this issue. And open source has been able to thrive uh, over the past number of years. And I guess I've now embarked on this new journey. I didn't predict this. It just, these things just happen. Um, and as I joined Western Digital, um, I've now embarked on this world of open source hardware, which seems like um, um, an oxymoron. How do you open source hardware? And this is not an, in, this, in the sense of OCP. And so what I'm going to do is try to give you a little bit of a rationale for how we think about this. 
and how we think, and I'm going to introduce to you RISC-V and open source processing, and you know, kind of keep in mind, Western Digital, we build hard drives and flash devices, and we have a product portfolio around that. We're not a CPU company. We don't intend to ever be a CPU company, but yet you're going to see we have taken a very, very active role in the notion of processing, and hopefully you'll understand why. Lawyers make me show this. We'll go through that quickly. All right, so we... <laughs> Clearly, I haven't been trained well enough. Um, I, you know, one of the things I do do sometimes when I show this slide is I say, if you can find the typo, I'll give you a free SD card. So, um, but uh, so, all right. So this is, you know, we kind of think uh, uh, in terms of data, right? I like you know, a new tagline we came up here with recently is, you know, they call it a data center, not a CPU center, right? Because it's about the data, and so. Um, we, we simplified this construct around big data and fast data. So think of big data from our perspective, it's sort of very hard drive centric, but it's where you care about volumes and volumes and volumes of data at a fairly low cost per bit. And think of fast data in two constructs. One is around main memory or memory centric computing, and also very high speed persistent storage, namely flash and some of the new persistent memories coming out. And the reality is our world is introducing a set of applications that need to be able to leverage both this construct of big data and fast data, where in some cases, fast data, latency, like you know, I like to use the, the self-driving car sending all of its data to the cloud, waiting a few seconds for an answer to coming back to decide whether or not it should turn left or right, not good enough. That's where you need this fast data, low latency, immediate processing close to the edge, right? So this processing close to the edge. Whereas the big data applications involve insights, uh, the machine learning analytics, um, and, and, and those kinds of applications. So what we noticed when we started to analyze this is that our, pro our world over that I lived in, this open source world that we lived in over the past uh, 30, 40 years, was really largely driven around general purpose processing. So the processors we have in our servers, our laptops, our desktops, et cetera, those are all basically general purpose processors. They're all very good, right? So this is not a good, bad thing. We absolutely need those things. I'm gonna start talking about RISC-V and sometimes people go to, is RISC-V gonna be a competitor to Intel? Don't go there, right? Intel needs to keep doing everything they're doing. They need to be as wildly successful and they need to keep driving this world because we will continue to have all sorts of applications, environments, Linux, and so on, where this general purpose processing is the best tool for the job. In addition to that, our world, thanks largely to things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, our world is needing more specialized processing. And that's been our motivation. And again, not an instead of, but an in addition to. And this is already happening. You're already seeing it. Most people have heard of a Google TPU, a TensorFlow processing unit. That is a special purpose piece of hardware. When people think about doing compute for machine learning, they tend to think about a GPGPU, a graphics processor, because it's good at vector processing, which is ideal for that world. So we're already seeing that. Other, other customers have created, or other entities have created custom hardware in the form of FPGAs um, in order to optimize their workload. And so this is what we're seeing now, is this expansion into this general purpose processing for big data and fast data. And so um, there's also been a tendency, and, and just so you know, a lot of people come to see me at the office, there'll be customers or there'll be startup companies that kind of want us to invest in them. And they seem to have this notion of, we, work, we are software companies and we work on commodity hardware. And they wear that like a badge of honor. So just a safety tip, if you're one of those, don't do that. Because the reality is, it's a fun little tagline, silicon is oxygen that allows software to breathe. I a guy I work with said, no, no, Martin, it's the opposite. Doesn't matter. The point of this is that hardware and software are now at a point where they need to come together and be optimized 
for each other. The amount of optimization we've been able to do with software with a general purpose processor has reached certain limits in certain cases. And increasingly, we're seeing these applications, I'll use TensorFlow again as the, as the example, where you need a TensorFlow framework and a TensorFlow Plus, and it's the combination of those two. It's the hardware and the software coming together that is actually the next generation and where we need to go to. And so we decided that we needed to think about this, again, in an open source construct, and um, we looked at everything, right? We looked at um, uh, all the various architectures out there. Um, and in fact, when I joined Western Digital, I had never heard of RISC V. So this was not some agenda thing. Um, the team at Western Digital, before I ever showed up, was um, the team that I uh, essentially joined and founded uh, with RISC V. But essentially, the beauty around RISC V was with this open source instruction set architecture, we had the opportunity to then create big data and fast data environments tied to our devices that allowed us to optimize the hardware and the software together. So if you want to think of this very simply, for example, we build um, controller chips for our, uh, flash, uh, our flash devices, our SSDs. With RISC-V, we now have the opportunity to create custom instructions to optimize that SSD for power, for performance, um, et cetera. Those are things that were very difficult and unavailable to us before. And so that was our big motivation to go there. Now, the big thing we want to accomplish from a data center perspective, this clicker is a little wonky, um, is this notion of a memory fabric. So remember I said big data and there's also fast data. One of the things that general purpose computing has done, and it doesn't matter if it's an Intel chip, an IBM chip, any other chip, is the memory interconnect is a point-to-point -point connection, right? So you have a CPU, you have a DDR, and then you have a DRAM memory, you have main memory. And this is a very tightly connected, optimized memory bus. Well, I said we are all about the data, and we think the data should be the center of the universe. So our goal is to create this centralized memory pool or data pool, to be more precise, that any number of processing engines can come and do processing on the data. And rather than say everything is general purpose, bring the best processing engine for the tool at hand to the data and use that same data, but process it in different ways. Whether it's a RISC-V CPU, maybe it's a GPU, maybe you've created your own FPGA, you've downloaded your algorithm to it, you've got other accelerators and things like that. This is basically our goal, is to have this universal memory fabric. Well, in, I'll say, the true notion of open source, we decided to just tell the world we were working on this. And that's why you see this thing called OmniExtend. And this OmniExtend fabric is um, free and available for anyone to go get. It's currently in development. So we are developing it with the community and anybody who wants to come and play. So why, so the question I often get is why this? There's other standards out there, whether it's OpenCAPI, Gen Z, um, uh, CCIX, you know, so on and so forth. Well, the reason why we ended up doing Omni Extend was not because we wanted to pick a fight or we said we wanted ours is better than yours. Nothing to do with any of that. In the case of, of uh, C6 and OpenCAPI, those were still point-to-point -point protocols. We were trying to create a fabric. We couldn't use those because they were point-to-point. -point. And they're not fully open, and we're trying to really go after this fully open environment. Gen Z would have been ideal. Um, and still might be ideal. Um, we haven't, like, we still actually actively work with Gen Z and we still love Gen Z. Gen Z wasn't ready for coherence and wasn't ready with an open um, physical interface. And so that's why we ended up doing Omni Extend. So we're trying to essentially standardize a cache coherency fabric which allows all of the CPUs to, sh to, to be, stay coherent on the cache front and have a uh, routable fabric. So this is gonna take a couple of forms. So one, we're partnering with Sci-5. Sci-5 is taking a coherency fabric that they had on chip, 
and extending it so that we can connect it to an interface outside the chip so it can go onto an Ethernet interface. So we're now, for the very first time, going to have a coherency fabric that can operate on an open industry standard physical interface, namely Ethernet. But when I say Ethernet, I don't mean Ethernet in the context of networking or TCP IP and all of those kinds of things. I mean Ethernet as in the physical interface. We are still, because it's a fabric and we want to bring things together, we have to have a switch. So we're going to use this barefoot Tofino, which is a programmable switch, and it uses a programming language called P4. And we're going to write all of the code for that switch, and all of the code for that switch is all going to be open source. Uh, and it actually, we're probably about a month or so away from um, that um, code release to become available. So we're really taking this notion of open sourcing um, to a whole new level, and we're really taking it to heart and bringing it to um, a hardware construct. So um, about a year and a half ago, when we started the RISC-V journey, we had said that, hey, Western Digital ships a billion cores a year, right? So for those of you who work in server land, um, you, know, you probably think about millions of servers. We think about billions of cores. Um, and we did the analysis, and we expect to, to, to double that and we said, we will transition the entire portfolio, this will take many, many years, to essentially go to RISC-V. So one of the things we could have done was to essentially go buy RISC-V cores from, and there's a variety of, so Sci-5, Coda SIP, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, of core providers out there. They're kind of like the arms of the world, but in RISC-V. And we could have done that, but we said, look, no, we've made this commitment to RISC-V. We need to learn and understand exactly how this works. So we essentially put a team together, and we went off and created um, our own RISC-V core. So this RISC-V core is not a derivative of anybody else's IP. Um, this is uh, built from the ground up from a team at Western Digital. Now, by the way, if all you people were silicon people, you'd be going, ooh, ah, this is really cool stuff, man, okay? This is, this is like JavaScript like you've never seen before in my world, okay? Um, <laughs> but so this is basically now a full open source core, and uh, we gave it a name, and it's called Swerve. And so let me go backwards. So the RV means RISC-V, so no surprise there. The we has two meanings. One is Western Digital. Um, and the second one is we, as in collaborative, as in all of us, as in we do this together. And then uh, S and Swerve was because we are swerving around general purpose computing and focusing on the special purpose. I'm not going to uh, bore you with all the details of what this core can do. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a performance metric just so you can kind of connect it in your brain. Um, this is basically a chart that was done by some folks at Berkeley University looking at all the cores. Now, I want to clarify something here. These are cores, not processors. Okay, so this is not a full Xeon processor or a full ARM processor. As you know, your processor on your laptop or your server has lots and lots of cores. And then around the cores is uncore, so memory controllers, I.O. controllers, all of those kinds of things. This is only the core. And so um, there's a performance uh, benchmark that's well known for just a core called a core mark per megahertz. So it's normalized on a megahertz basis. And so this is basically the core mark per megahertz of a variety of different. This was done around 2015, I think. Um, so it's getting a little bit old, but it gave us all the data on one chart. And you can see the blue bars are for out of order cores, and uh, the orange bars are in order cores. So swerve. Um, came in at 4.9. It's actually about 5.1 now um, on a per core mark per megahertz basis. And so here's the interesting data point for you and why this special purpose thing matters. When we started this core development effort, our ambition, our target was to achieve parity with our current cores. Right? We were saying we, we, we don't want to blow it out of the park. We want to be realistic. We're doing this for the first time. You know, let's, let's have realistic goals. And we said, if all we do is achieve parity to what we have, that we'll call it victory. 
What ended up happening was 50% better performance, 30% better uh, silicon area, and 30% lower power utilization. That's what ended up happening. And the reason is because this core is a production level core. It will go in our devices. So think, you know, when you buy your USB stick next year, just say, hey, RISC V, I, I know. Um, there won't be a RISC V logo on it, that's okay. Um, but the thing is that um, we were able to focus on the task at hand. And as a result of focusing on the task at hand, we were able to achieve levels of capability that were so far beyond. And so for those of you who work at large companies like Western Digital and others, you know that when you sort of go to an R&D team and say, hey, look at my PowerPoint, this is what I'm gonna build and you should get on board, that they tend to mm, kind of say, hey, you know, I don't build my product plan around a PowerPoint. Once the team actually released the core and now they had actual, they went from PowerPoint to this is real, the amount of pull internal to Western Digital went up exponentially. And we've now had a whole number of requests for all sorts of variants that are pretty interesting that would not otherwise be possible if we didn't have our own core. But we're at the Open Source Leadership Conference and so we said, hey, our cores would be embedded cores. That's where we're gonna start. Um, and they would be for internal use only, right? This is kind of, we're, we're not doing industry thing. Um, but it's open sourced. And uh, so some people will say, but it's a chip, it's like a core, like what does that mean, open source? For all of you who have never designed a chip in your life, let me show you a little bit of what it looks like to build a chip. On the left is what's called RTL code. This is the code that a silicon designer writes to do a chip, a core, or any other kind of silicon. On the right is C code. And to the uninitiated, if you look left and right, they probably go, it just looks like software. That's the point. Building silicon is building software. There are a few differences. So one of the things that software programmers do when you write that C code on the right is you kind of think in sequential terms. So every line of the code that you see gets executed in sequence. And even if you're an expert uh, multi-threaded programmer, still things happen in the sequence. The big difference with the code on the, on the left, and if you really want to follow along, you see this always at positive clock edge or positive edge, essentially things happen simultaneously. And that's the big difference between silicon development and software development, is on the left, what's between those that begin and end block happens simultaneously, not in sequence. Now, if you're all software people and you're like, oh, why do I need to know any of this and why does any of it matter? Well, guess what? There's a thing called high-level synthesis. So by the way, on the left, it's called synthesize. On the right, it's called compile, right? So you compile your code or uh, in hardware, you synthesize your code. There's a thing called high-level synthesis that will allow you to take C, C++, and other language codes and actually compile them into the thing that's on the left to then create something that is synthesizable to produce a chip. So we are actually in the early phases of a world where even all of you who are potentially software developers are going to write software where your output is not the CICD DevOps and go through Jenkins and all that kind of stuff, your actual output is synthesizable into hardware that is optimized for a very specific algorithm like a machine learning thing. And so that's why this is so, so interesting to us. But when we say it's open source hardware, well guess what, we're just open sourcing source code. So if you go to GitHub, and you go download our Swerve core, what you're gonna get is basically all of this RTL code, the, the language is called System Verilog, so it's written in System Verilog, and that's what you're gonna get. All right, so we also um, created this instruction set simulator. So we wanted to basically have an environment where we could test the RISC-V core and anybody else's RISC-V core, and so for that we needed a simulator.
And so we essentially had a completely separate independent team write the simulator while we had another team developing the core. And so this instruction set simulator in the spirit of everything we're doing related here is all about uh, open source. And so this instruction set simulator is also available for anyone uh, that wants to do uh, RISC-V simulations and run an instruction set simulator. Um, our Swerve core is 32-bit. The simulator will do both 32 and 64-bit. All right, so that's it. So basically, we, did, we are um, passionate about having a memory fabric where data is the center of the universe, and we allow any, any general purpose or special purpose processing engine to communicate through that open fabric and have access to the data at very low latency and in a cache coherent way and built on this ubiquitous ethernet fabric um, that everybody has access to. We did our very first RISC-V core. We're just getting started. As I said, we're already working on variants. But let me give you another piece of data. So for all of you who have been working in open source like I have since the late 90s or through the 2000s, your psyche is sort of adapted to and you take for granted how all this stuff works, right? In this silicon world, this is all new, folks. And the, the, the thing that's fascinating for me and the reason that I mentioned the book at the beginning is all of this very early education is sort of where I'm finding myself again today. Because all of the people that are in this, this silicon world are asking all of the same questions around how does this work and what about licensing, what about my IP and how does this collaboration thing work and so on and so forth. All of these things, are, it's essentially a complete deja vu. And so it's fascinating to see how this works. I'll tell you a story. There was one of these IP providers, uh, these intellectual property providers, and when we released our RISC-V core to the open source community, their instant reaction was, you are competing with me. I said, wow, that's interesting. Not in CPU business, not in the IP business. So I don't know exactly how I'm competing with you. And I said, why don't you just take the Swerve core off of GitHub include it in your portfolio, wrap your tools around it, and sell it. There's a little company we know called Red Hat that did something similar with the Linux kernel. And they just looked at me like dumbfounded, and I said, I just accelerated your roadmap by a year. And so it was a complete aha moment. So this stuff that all of you take for granted in this world is all going to be brand new, and I need your help. Because as I said, the real world is not hardware versus software, and there's no winners and losers. The only winning comes when the hardware and the software come together and work and are optimized to work together. And you're gonna see this new world where software becomes hardware in order to be fully optimized. But I've got, I don't know, let's call it a 15 to 20 year gap of DNA of psyche of people who need to get up to speed, just like all of you did in learning how open source works. And so that's what a big part of the RISC-V Foundation um, is all about. And so I'm gonna ask Jim Zemlin to come back up here and do a special introduction with me. All right, thank you, Martin. First of all, let's give him a hand for like some amazing talk. So, Martin uh, has been the interim CEO of the RISC-V Foundation, and speaking as somebody who runs a foundation, it's uh, sometimes a bit of a thankless task. Uh, I'm getting fired, folks. There, <laughs> and, and so we're going to let uh, Martin go today. Uh, but when he called me up and said, hey, you know, we're looking for someone to come run this, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a tall order because you need somebody who is technically savvy, uh, understands the world of silicon and CPU technology, uh, who is emotionally intelligent, can lead through influence, can herd cats to uh, create great outcomes, uh, and immediately to my mind came Callista Redmond, who we want to introduce as the newest CEO of the RISC-V Foundation. Please welcome Callista Redmond. Welcome. You may regret this, Callista, but uh, welcome, and uh, we're so happy to have you. 
Thanks, thanks so much. Well, I mean, you've built a great foundation, not just in the sense of an org, but a set of technical artifacts that we can continue to innovate on, continue to build the community, and engage a wide variety of stakeholders. So it's super exciting for me to join. Thank All you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, we're happy to have you on board. All right, thanks, look everybody. for more from Callista. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we right. look forward to great things out of Risk Five.